Praise the Lord. Hey, let's open our Bibles up to the book of Ephesians. We're continuing with uh, the officers of the church. Um, today we're going to look at the prophet. There's a lot of them around. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are just nonsense. Mm -hmm. Somebody read for us Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Amen. So we understand so far that uh, as far as the church is concerned, uh, God has instituted five offices, all right, five job descriptions, five role descriptions. However you want to look at that, they're not titles, they are a work that is done. They are gifts from God, according to Ephesians chapter 4, and they are vital to and essential uh, to the effective working of the church, and I believe during the whole or complete gospel day, all right? Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, tells us that God is not the author of confusion. Amen. And Paul, uh, in the same chapter, concerning um, the church, said this, let all things be done decently and in order. Mm -hmm. So that tells me that not only is God in order, but it tells me also that his church is a place of order. Amen. Mm -hmm. and, and, and some people, you know, get confused about this, but, you know, look at the whole of creation. And it's a creation of order. God gave us the physical to teach us spiritual things, all right, to show us spiritual things. Amen. If you look at, you know, especially now, if you look at the galaxies, you know, especially when you see photos from these telescopes that got out in space now, all right, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's all in order. And you can go to the smallest atom, and it's all order. They're all a picture of perfect order. Amen. Now, I would understand that the church is the pinnacle of God's creation, all right? It is the, Bible says, it's the apple of his eye, amen? <laughs> so surely she must display that absolute uh, uh, description of decency and order, amen? <laughs> now, I believe that God gave us these gifts, you know, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor and teacher, for that purpose, to keep order and decency within his church. Amen. Not uh -huh. to lord over God's people, because that's where a lot of people make this big mistake. Because they think that they've been called to an office in the church, then they can be bosses and tell people what to do. Amen. And that's just not the truth. All right. Not to lord it over God's people, but to direct and give instruction to the church. Now, we must always remember that the church of God is not a prison. Amen. One can come and one can go. Amen. But we also need to be reminded that if one is in the church, there must also be an order to follow. Amen. So to put it this way, the church of God is not a free for all. Amen. Where we just do whatever we want to do. Amen. That, that, that model doesn't work. Amen. However, on the other hand, there is no person that stands between you and me and God, as you see happening in Babylon, certainly in the Roman Catholic uh, institution, uh, where they believe there is a person who stands before them, uh, between them and God, but not just mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, but a physical person itself. Amen. Mm -hmm. And that's just not the truth. No person stands between you or me and God. Amen. And, and I think that's very important. All right. So no person, whether they hold the office of apostle or pastor or, or evangelist or, or, or bishop, 
has dominion or rulership or lordship over your or over a person's faith. And I think this is very important to understand that. In 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 24, and I remember we used to have this verse when we're down in Industrial Avenue, we used to have this above the door. Yeah. And I said this, not for that we have dominion, and that word dominion is rulership over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith you stand. Amen. As an apostle, Paul, under the authority uh, of the church and, and of God, could not compel anybody to follow his instructions. And there, 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 there is no physical stick or, 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 or even threat, amen, that a person has to cause another person to follow a certain way, amen. But as you can see in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, Paul sought to be a help. He sought to be a co-worker in the kingdom, all right? Because ultimately, according to 1 Corinthians 2, verse 24, we all stand by our own faith, our own belief. Notice this, for by faith you stand. Not my faith, not the next door neighbor's faith, but you will stand and you stand by what you believe. Amen. There is no person who is going to defend you on the last day Amen. other than your life lived and the belief or faith you had. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Amen. So, so in that sense, the officers within the church, that is their duty. A mind to, to 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 encourage the church to walk by faith. Amen. Yeah. To to have a solid belief. Yeah. Amen. And and again, I just want to just draw a little line there as well. All right. That no matter who a person is, no matter even claiming to be an apostle, they themselves are not infallible. Amen. And I'll give you an example right now. All right. Who did Paul have to rebuke? Remember, he had to rebuke both the apostle called Barnabas, Barnabas. and the apostle called Peter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. He, he, he openly exposed them as being hypocrites. Yeah. Right? So, so the important thing is do not look upon somebody who has an office within the church as being infallible because they're not. Amen. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, only, the only infallibility we have is Jesus Christ and his word. Amen. And I got his original word. Amen. Does that make sense? All right. So, so Paul, as an example of an office, an officer in the church, if you like, all right, saw himself only to be a helper of your joy. Amen. Does it make sense? Mm. Now, obviously, as, as in, in, you can read in Ephesians chapter 4, the ministry of the church of God is a gift to the church. But it's not just an office. It's not just a job. Amen. You cannot simply identify the office by the work that is being done. And, and I kind of looked at the, this this week because uh, I think this is important. What is important is the spirit of the mm -hmm. one working the gift. That's the important element. Amen? Yes. The, see, the spirit of the one working the gift is closely associ associated to the motive or mm -hmm. reason for doing the work. Amen. And that's important because today... Many who profess an office in the church, and certainly in Babylon, do so as hirelings yeah. because they do it for financial gain. Mm -hmm. They do it for positional gain. Mm -hmm. They do it for recognition. Amen. So it's not just the doing of the work. It is the motive or character or the spirit Behind. of the one who is doing the work that identifies the true gifts 
that God gave to the church. Amen? Amen. See, Paul and the true bearers of the office, offices in the church of God do so out of service and care for the oh. children of God and his church. That is the primarily the the primary motive yeah. of what they do. As Paul said, we are helpers of your joy. Amen. So the spirit which identifies motive is so important. Yeah. As many today are being dominated by office bearers who care <laughs> little about spiritual well-being. Amen. Amen. And more concerned about physical gain. Mm. Isn't that true? So it's important yeah. that you, well, let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and let's put a bit more light on this. Among Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12, it says, And we beseech you, and of course that was Paul, Timothy, and Silvanus, if you remember from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6, were also apostles. Amen. I actually believe that Silvanus is Silas. Yeah. Amen. You read about Silas, all right? Mm -hmm. It says, To know them, that is, I beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now, that word beseech, it's the same one of um, yeah, you, uh, Romans 12 and 1. Yeah. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God. All right? yeah. He is entreating. Yeah. Amen. He, he is asking urgently to know them. Yeah. Just don't take it for granted that anybody who claims to be an, an apostle or a prophet or whatever is a God-called person. Mm -hmm. Amen. You see, why is this so important? Why did he say, I beseech you to know them? Because it's dealing with the governance of the church. Isn't that right? Yeah. You see, so he's saying it is vital to know them over you in the Lord. And that word over you is the Greek word for a storm, for a STEMI, or P R O I S T M I. And we've talked about this already. It means to set on place before, to set on place before, to set over, to direct and maintain. It literally means early. And of course, early deals with eldership. All right. So to explain this, Paul explains his own character. Paul explains his own motive in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Why it is so important? Not just to see what a person is doing, but the motive. Understand the yeah. motive of what, why they're doing what they are doing. Mm -hmm. okay. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, Paul said, is it for though you have 10,000 instructor, instructors in Christ, you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers? For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel, wherefore I beseech ye, be ye followers of me. What's Paul trying to address here? What's he saying? What was even the problem in Paul's day? You see, even in Paul's day, there appeared to be many, many leaders yeah, who all had the wrong spirit. Mm -hmm. Amen? So it's not just today. Today it's probably manifold thousands of times worse, but even in his day, he could identify leaders in the church who are not the called of God, who mm -hmm. had ulterior, ul ulterior motives. Yeah. He says... The true leaders have a what kind of spirit? Serving. Yeah, but what kind of spirit did he say they had? Remember, Paul, Paul, Paul is using language Christ. that you might understand from the physical 
what the spiritual is. And he's saying that that those that they should have a father spirit. Mm. Amen. A father spirit, a caring spirit, a give of oneself spirit, if need be, the complete giving of oneself to death, even yeah. for the children of God. Mm. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, you know, those who truly love their children, what would they do for their children if they mm. were in harm's way? Mm. The end of the world. Would they just look on? No. no. Maybe a bad parent would, but a good yeah. parent would not. Exactly. So would a good parent just let their children waste their life away? No. And they'd give them instruction, would they not? Yeah. I mean, they would have that father or mother spirit. Yes. Yeah. Amen. And that's what yeah. he's saying is, is the true ministry has that kind of spirit. I mean, they have no ulterior motive but the love and care for God's people and his church. Amen? Amen? And in fact, you know, if you look at the, uh, certainly the original apostles or fathers of the church, we want to call them that, almost every single one of them except John, and John went through some things, I mean, out of their love and care, for the church and God's children, sacrificed themselves. I mean, they all died a horrible death. Yeah. I mean, to preserve God's children and God's church. Amen. Uh -huh. Amen. Furthermore, if you look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 28, give you an idea of Paul's, Paul's spirit. Because yeah, just because one does the work of a prophet or apostle or, or a pastor does not make one a gift from God. Mm -hmm. I think uh, in other places, Paul said, you've got to watch out because uh, the devil can masquerade in false leaders, false, false leaders and look like the real deal. Mm -hmm. Well, the real deal, all right, has a different spirit. He says here in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 28, he says, Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of the churches. What was on Paul's heart every single day? What was his burden every single day? Yes, people. I mean, the care of all the congregations yeah, of the church of, of God. I mean, it was on his heart and mind every single day. Yeah. And you would expect that from an apostle. Mm -hmm. Would you not? Amen. So, so that's what we're talking about. We're doing the work of the offices of the church of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. And I believe that 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 every one of those offices, those five offices, would have that same care, love, and concern for God's people and His church. Amen. So I just wanted to lay a little bit more there. It's not just, you know, nobody can lord it over somebody else. Mm -hmm. Nobody in the sense is ruling over anybody else. Because mm -hmm. so I just want to put it in, in place here as well, and I'll probably mention it later on, but it just come to my mind now. Just because one is an apostle or a prophet or evangelist does not mean that that person uh, does not need the gifts of God. Mm -hmm. Amen? The person who has the working in the office of, of apostle still needs the office of pastor and prophet and, and evangelist and teacher to be made perfect. Yeah. Just because one has an office of a pastor that does not make one perfect and complete. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Because no one is above anybody else and we all are the one body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So last week we looked at the office of apostle, amen? And on the surface it looked like there was a rank, you know, the apostle, then the prophet, and then the evangelist, and then the pastor, and then the teacher, amen? So people could lead to believe that that's a rank. And, of course, in Babylon that's exactly how it's looked upon, as a rank, that an apostle is above a prophet, and a prophet's above an evangelist, and so forth. 
Amen. That's why they call themselves by the different by the different names. All right. However, that is just not true. One is not more important than the other. And that together, amen, they work to the perfecting of the saints. And the saints is the whole body of Christ. Amen. You know, sometimes, you know, we're, whatever God has called us to do, that is his purpose. And that's what we should be satisfied in. It's a bit like we heard, you know, with, with uh, Jim Rowan's testimony. You just got to believe that God's in absolute control. Mm -hmm. Amen. And the best way for you and for me to receive a good reward when this is all finished is to do what God has called us to do, not to go and do what he's called somebody else to do. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's again half the problem today. People become covetous, don't they? Well, I'm not going to do the dishes. I'm called to sit at the feet of Jesus. You kind of know what I mean. And we, we, we are all called to do our part in the work of the kingdom. And that should satisfy us. And so, anyway, today we'll look at the office of prophet. Amen. And that's probably one of the probably most misunderstood offices in the church. All right. Uh, it's certainly abused probably more than any other office, especially in Babylon, certainly in false religion. Amen. You, know, you probably witnessed, have witnessed yourself so many false prophecies. I remember, if you remember, um, uh, you know, before the last elections over in America, you know, all these Pentecostal preachers and pastors and so mm -hmm. forth and apostles were all prophesying that Donald Trump would win. You know what? Not one of them was stoned to death <laughs> for their false prophecy. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Amen? And they just tell one false thing after an other, amen, Thanks. with no consequence. Yeah. Remember in the Old Testament, what happened to the false prophet? He was stoned to death, amen. So, again, that is a picture, which tells me although we might not see a physical consequence to these false prophets, there certainly is a spiritual consequence. Yeah. in that they receive spiritual death. Yeah. I mean, that's why we have to be very careful in dividing God's word. Mm. Because if we misappropriate it, I'm going to say, because we're not infallible, but in a purposeful and intentional way, uh, we, we could be in serious trouble. Yeah. True? Yeah. Amen. You see, uh, there are those today who believe they can be taught to be a prophet. And remember, school of the prophets. And one can be trained to be a prophet. Amen. And then at the other end of the scale, we have those today who believe that the office of prophet is no longer. That it all finished at the end of the first century as with the apostles. Amen. So let's have some scripture and bring some light on this, all right? We turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but somebody could read verse 10 for us. To another the working of miracles, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse, diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. Amen. Then go down to verse 28 and read that one for me. Okay. And also verse 29. Um, and God hath said some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. All, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, all workers of miracles. 
then Romans 12 and 6 says, having their gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. And of course, we read before in Ephesians 4 and verse 11, also mentioning prophets. Amen. Now, clearly, it would be hard to teach from the scriptures that the prophets died out. Mm. Because then many other things have died out as well. And then according to my thoughts, then then the church today would, ju would just be a cold and dead place. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 We know they're doing anything. Now, from Ephesians chapter 4, we understand that the mm -hmm. office of a prophet of prophecy is a gift from God. Mm -hmm. You cannot learn to be a prophet. It's a supernatural, miraculous gift from God. Amen? It's not based on one's human abilities, one's human efforts. That's what's so sad today, especially in false religion. And I suppose, and it can creep into the church of God as well, is mm -hmm. that we base somebody's purpose within the church on their physical abilities and physical appearance. Mm -hmm. And that in turn has caused, I believe, many of God's people to be inactive. You know, those who were called to 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 operate in certain offices because they didn't quite meet the expectation. As I said last last week, I'd have never chosen myself to preach God's word because I couldn't speak one word fully following another. Amen? So do not, amen, sell yourself short because you think you cannot do it. The truth is you cannot do it. Mm -hmm. Unless God help you to do it. Yes. Amen. And and you don't know whether you can do it until you try and do it. Mm -hmm. If you feel compelled, amen, within your heart to do, well, the best way to find out if it's a call from God is give it a go. Mm -hmm. And you'll soon find out if it's right or wrong. Yeah. And, and and if it's wrong, if it's no, no definitely not my call for this. Well, just turn around and then go down a different road. Not just sitting around saying, "I wonder, I wonder, I wonder," will just end up with ending your life in a place of regret. Yeah. Mm. Amen. It's like as it was a sister Sarah saying earlier. You know, God has called us for such a time as this. Mm. Amen. Amen. Now, last week we spoke about gifts, and Romans 11 verse 29 tells us, for well, the gifts and callings of, and calling of God are without repentance. God doesn't change his mind. Amen. God is concerned for his church throughout the gospel day. Amen. Ephesians 4 and verse 8 says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Why did God give gifts unto men? <laughs> gifts were the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the teacher, the um, you know, in context of Ephesians 4, uh, the pastor, the teacher. And verse 12 says, for the perfecting of the saints. And I believe that's inclusive of those who hold an office for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro mm -hmm. and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There are religious people who masquerade as leaders. And their one purpose is to lead people away from Christ. <laughs> I, I, sometimes I feel I'm, I'm ultra harsh 
Yeah, and, and have trouble with some of our Cogma students, especially one. I mean, but Protestantism, its one single purpose is to lead people away from Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 They, the, Protestant is the daughter of the harlot. Amen. And, and uh, you know, uh, I, I know there are good people and I know there are probably good pastors and, and so forth uh, who's, who where their heart is not that way, that they're not intentionally doing that. But by the belief and doctrines they teach, that's exactly what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I believe yeah. that's one of the callings that we have especially yeah. through the work of Cogma, to try and steer some of these, you know, the, these these people in a good direction where they begin to ask questions and think themselves, use their brain. Amen. Because most people today don't use their brain. Amen. They just follow the stream, the mainstream. <laughs> but God <laughs> gave us intellect that we can, <laughs> we can, Search things out ourselves. Mm. Amen. Praise the Lord. So what is prophecy? It comes from the Greek word, is it prophetia, which comes from two Greek words, pro, which means forth, and phemi, which means to speak. So it means to, in, in our sense, it means to speak forth the mind, and counsel of God. Mm. It is a declaration that cannot be known by natural means. This is mm. the important part. Amen. Prophecy has two aspects. It has the foretelling aspects, and it has the forth telling. Forth telling and foretelling. And we're going to explain that a little bit. Foretelling would be what, do you think? Just telling someone about something. If you're going to be a foreteller, it's like a fortune teller, what do they do? Prepare someone with the truth. So, what do you a foreteller, foretelling is to, is to speak of things to that are going to occur before they occur. So future things, events. All right, that is foretelling. <clears throat> what is forthtelling? Well, it's the gift of understanding prophecy to expound it and to reveal it. Mm, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. See, I believe that forthtelling is something more than just preaching the gospel and presenting a Sunday message. Mm -hmm. All right? Because some people just say, well, a prophet today is preaching. Mm -hmm. And I say, yes and no. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes <clears throat> and no. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a bit like every Sunday, for the most part, I am required to prepare and present a message. Okay. And the message that I'm preparing is, is based upon a topic we're covering or a topic that I feel somebody needs. Uh, but my intellect and natural abilities are also involved. But forth telling us something more than that. All right, it, it, is, it is a divine gift to move people into truth, mm -hmm. both concerning doctrine and also prophecy. And, and I thought about that, and, and, and I thought about our own journey together. Um, when we discovered holiness, all right, that was forth telling. When we discovered the truth concerning the rapture, that was forth telling. That was the office of prophecy. 
right? the second coming, ordinances. Okay, we all believed things another way once, but through God's gift, he was able to move us away from something we held fast to to something else. Does that make sense? That is yeah. forth-telling. Amen? You know, uh, then you know, if, if you consider prophecy, um, um you think of the sign of Jonah, three days and three nights. You know, for how many years did we all believe that Jesus was crucified on a Friday and rose on a Sunday? Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. But then through the expanding of prophecy, God was able to move us to see that that was just not true. Mm -hmm. That came through forth-telling. Uh Daniel's 70 weeks to dis, to to um, uh, reveal that the gap period was nonsense. All right, and and that message actually moves people. All right, that's forth telling. All right, does that that make sense to you? And it also kind of reminds me, in, in some ways that a person who is has the office of a prophet is not always moving in that office 24-7. It's a gift from God with that ability to be able to move people from a falsehood to the truth. We see examples of foretelling in the Bible. Sorry, first of all, look at foretelling, Acts 21. Somebody can read for us verses 10 and 11. It says, as we tarried. As we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus, and when he was come to us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, This, save the Holy Ghost, shall so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owned this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Wow. <laughs> yeah. At this stage, some of us might decide to go a different direction and <laughs> not go to Jerusalem. But Paul didn't, of course. Why, why did why did why did Paul go to go to Jerusalem anyway? Because he had absolute trust in God. Yeah. Amen. Awesome. Acts eleven verse twenty seven. The same prophet. Acts eleven verse twenty seven and twenty eight. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and they stood upon one of them named Agabus, and is signified by the Spirit that they should be a great dirt throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Amen. All right. Uh, now, that, that also tells us that there was more than one prophet in Jerusalem. Yeah. Amen. Because Agabus was just one of several. Amen. Now, also, I believe, now I can't be 100% sure, but I believe that prophecy um, in the New Testament pertains to God's people and the church only. Because what it actually did, if you read the account in Acts 11, verse 28, Acts 11, it moved the rest of the church in other places to reach out to the believers in Jerusalem and to help them with, obviously, means, you know, the food and whatever they needed to get through this famine that was going to take place. Amen? Mm. Paul himself had the gift of foretelling in uh, 
2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and also 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1. He's got 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3, and somebody else got 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1. Okay. Let no man deceive you. Uh, no. Yeah, Let no that's it. Let no man yep. deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that the man of saying, sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Amen. So he was foretelling a day in the future yeah. where the man of sin would be falling away, which took place. The man of sin was revealed. Amen. Mm. And 1 Timothy 4 and 1. Look at this expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Amen. So again, he's dealing with the future. What would happen? In the future, amen. So he was foretelling, yeah. all right? And then we have the second aspect called forth-telling, mm -hmm. which is that divine gift to understand and especially expound prophecy. And probably John uh, uh, is a good example of that. Remember, he was also an apostle. We turn to Revelations 22 and verse 18. By For, I <laughs> For I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Who, who received the prophecy? John. John then, didn't he? John, John received the prophecy. He but he prophecy. also had the gift to expound and give clarity to the prophecy. You turn yeah. to 1 John 2 and verse 18. Remember, uh, John's letters 1, 2, and 3 are the recent, the most recent books. All right? Is that right? The most recent. They're the youngest. All right? They were written after the book of the Revelation. Mm -hmm. So 1 John 2 and verse 18. Here he is expounding the prophecy. Yeah. He's got that one for us. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Yeah. Amen. So he says Antichrist shall come, future. All right. But now he says, no, come on. He says it, this future is now. Yeah. Even now are there many antichrists. Amen. In Revelations 10, verse 11. And he, said unto, and he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Amen. So think about that for a moment. Yeah. What was that to John? Because at this moment, that was just not possible. He was imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos. Yeah. So here he is being foretold, foretold. that he would be released from the Isle of Patmos. Amen. And then if we go to Revelation 22 and verse 9, we understand that John was, we know, was one of the apostles, but he also had the gift of prophecy and filled the office of a prophet. He's got that for us, Revelation 22 verse 9. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. Amen. 
you know, uh, for, for those who think the office of prophet is finished, the Bible has much to say about prophecy. Yeah. It is most misunderstood as there are two aspects to the office of a prophet, both foretelling and forth telling. Amen. If you remember, um, Philip the evangelist had four daughters who were prophets. Amen. The church of Antioch in Acts 13 and verse 1, all right, had prophets and teachers. In Acts 15, verse 32, Judas and Silas. Now, I believe that Judas, if you want to turn there for a moment, Acts 15, verse 32. It says, and Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. Now, I believe that Judas is Barnabas. And Silas is Silvanus. And what were they? Apostles. They were apostles. But notice they were also prophets. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now, you know, it says, and exhorted the brethren in many words and confirmed them. That tells me the office of prophet was vital in the morning church. And surely if it was vital in the morning time, it must be even more vital in the evening time. Mm -hmm. Amen. It also tells me that the apostles also had the gift of the prophet. Mm. Amen. That doesn't mean that they were always operating in the gift of prophecy. Now, as we conclude here, Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1 says, follow after charity and decide and desire spiritual gifts. What does he say then? But rather that you prophesy. Rather that you prophesy. Amen. What's so important about prophecy? Verse 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Verse 22. This is a, this is amazing. This, this verse is just. Yeah, it's just, um, you shake your head when you read this. Wherefore, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22, wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Mm -hmm. What does false religion do with this verse? How do they read this verse? Don't they read it the exact opposite? Yeah. 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 Amen. They believe that speaking in tongues is for the believer. And that's why they all do it in their churches. Yeah. That's the complete opposite. To what Paul is saying. All right. It is some, some, some. Amen. Anyway. Anyway. As we finish, expounding the sign of Jonah, Daniel 70 weeks, that's all prophecy. It's not just the prophecy itself, it's the ability to expound what the prophecy means in such a way that by the power and gift of God, people are moved into the truth. Mm. At the conclusion of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 31, Paul says, but covet earnestly the best gifts. What do you think is the best gift? Mm. 
What do you believe is the, is the most vital gift? Reconciling to people. People are reconciling people to God. The mm. office of the prophet yeah. would be, I believe, the most vital gift. The ability to move people mm. from that which is false that which is true. into mm. the truth. Yeah. The ability to convince people, not by their own intelligence or whatever, or charisma, but the gift of God. See, I believe if we operate with the right spirit, if people can see that we care, I mean, that we're not just about shoving belief down somebody's throat, but that we actually care for them, yeah. that father, that mother spirit, yeah. we have chance. To convince. Yeah. I mean, it's what we do in Africa. I mean, we don't sit on stages. I'll sit amongst the people. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I've got to show that I care about them, yeah. not myself yeah. and my place and my position. Mm -hmm. It's how we have the best chance. Amen. Amen. As I said, it also appears that certainly many of the apostles also had and filled the office of the prophet. Amen. In fact, as we go along, we'll probably discover that Paul, well, he was just an astounding man, held mm -hmm. the office, or well, he virtually held every office. Do you know what I like about Paul? One of the things I do like about him is he was never concerned about running out of time. Um, he was quite happy to stay in a place for a number of years and be like a pastor yeah. and be a teacher. All right? He didn't always have to be traveling around here, there, and everywhere. You kind of know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like Jim Rowan said, I believe he could sleep at night. Mm -hmm. Not be worried about anything. Amen. Amen. Certainly when um, Agabus told him that, that uh, the future was not looking too good for him, I don't think Paul lost one Thanks. moment of sleep, didn't lose a hair on his head, and knew God was utterly in control. Amen. 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 All right, I'm going to leave it there. Any questions? Anyone want to add anything?